On Scotland's west coast lies the quiet seaside resort of Troon. For one week in July, this would be the centre of the golfing world. And returning here for the 133rd Open Championship carried special significance for one player in particular. The last time Justin Leonard walked up the 18th fairway at Royal Troon, he was a promising 25-year-old whose life was about to change completely. With a brilliant putting performance on the daunting back nine, Leonard snuck ahead of Jesper Parnovic and Darren Clark to win the 1997 Open Championship. It's just incredible to come back and relive some of the memories and, and, and how vivid they are. Uh, especially from that Sunday's round. It was a little quieter this morning, but, uh, you know, some great feelings. And uh, that whole day Sunday was just, uh, was incredible for me personally. And, and um, um, to, to be back and, and, and walk the fairways again and, and have those, those images and memories so vivid in my mind, um, it really makes it special to be back. He was the fifth successive American to claim the Open title at Troon, going back through Mark Kalkovecchia with that chip in 1989, Tom Watson in 82, Tom Weisskopf in the rain in 1973, and Arnold Palmer with his army of fans in 62. Leonard clearly knows what it takes to win here. Back nine is very difficult and, and maybe even more difficult now with a new tee on 11, a new tee on 15. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's just a great, a great golf course with two totally different nines and, and uh, you, know, you, you really have to change your strategy when, when you're making the turn. Tom Weisskopf was another former Troon champion back in town, playing in what he announced would be his last competitive tournament. After getting out of bed early to play a practice round with Tiger Woods, who typically booked the first tee-off time on every practice day, Weisskopf was in no doubt about the state of the world number one's much analysed game. I had never seen him hit a golf ball in person until this morning. It's awesome. Yeah, it, uh, he defines the complete player, simply said. I don't think he enjoyed it even a tenth as much as I did, you know, because uh, it's, it's impressive, it really is. And uh, it's a day that I'll never forget. If Tiger was going to win his ninth major, he'd have to see off the likes of Ernie Els and Retief Goosen, while Masters champion Phil Mickelson had clearly also discovered the secret of winning majors. With local favourite Colin Montgomery, a late qualifier through the new international final qualifying system, back in the right mood to compete, it was becoming increasingly hard to pick a winner. But all were agreed on one thing. Royal True was in fantastic condition. The course is absolutely perfect. I mean, uh, you, you'd be hard pressed to find uh, an open course in the last 10, 12 years that's in as good a condition as this one. A drier than usual spring in Ayrshire meant the rough was less threatening than it might be, but there were no plans to trick up the course to compensate. After the conditions at Shinnecock Hills for the US Open the previous month, the players were grateful for the RNA's approach. Never worry about low scores as long as we find the best champion, and uh, we don't mind what he scores. If the wind blows, the scores will be high. If it doesn't blow, then the scores will be much more competitive, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see. After three days of sunshine during the practice rounds, the evening before the championship was another glorious one. With more good weather expected over the next few days, the scene was set for a magnificent open. Preliminaries out of the way, Troon was ready for the tournament to begin. At 6.30 on Thursday morning, the first player to tee off was an Australian who finished in a share of seventh place the last time the Open Championship came to Royal Troon. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I welcome you to Royal Troon Golf Club for the first day's play of the 133rd Open Golf Championship. This is game number one on the tee from Australia, Peter O'Malley.
After Peter O'Malley had the honour of the opening shot, there was an early rush of big names on the first tee. Before breakfast time, many of the world's top golfers had already begun their challenge for the old claret jug. Among the early starters was a less familiar face, 20-year-old amateur Nick Flanagan. He gained his place here by becoming the first Australian to win the US Amateur Championship for more than a century and won high praise from Tiger Woods after a practice round together at the Masters. Flanagan was turning pro the day after the Open ended, so this was a huge week for him. I'd love to win leading amateur this week. Um, if I can do that, that'd be definitely a big confidence builder going into next week and turning pro. And, and I haven't played as well as I would have liked to in the first, the first two majors, so if I could have a good one this week, it's probably, probably the toughest, toughest one to play in. Um, I'd be very happy. The son of a coal miner and a supermarket checkout worker from a small town in New South Wales, Flanagan does not come from a stereotypical golfing background. His parents had to mortgage their holiday home to pay for his travels as an amateur. My family have um, sacrificed a lot in the last last seven or eight years I've been playing. So um, coming over here this year, playing as much overseas as I have been, is um, has been a struggle again. And my parents have had to work really hard to to get me over here. And, and I can't thank them enough for what they've done. So it'll be good to, to good to get good to get out here and um, and repay them somehow. That determination and his nerve were both evident on the first tee. With most of the pros taking irons for their opening tee shots, Flanagan ripped his driver 360 yards down the middle of the fairway, just short of the green. Birdie on the first, and his tournament was up and running. He wasn't the only player starting well, with the front nine playing even easier than expected in the benign conditions. An early contender for shot of the tournament came from a player many expected still to be in the mix come the 72nd hole. Yeah. Ernie Els made the notorious eighth, the postage stamp, look very easy. But Royal Troon is not a cause to be taken lightly, as Els found out on 17. I had a bit of a downhill lie in the bunker, but it wasn't the most difficult shot I've ever had in my life. I just, you know, just messed it up. From such a high light on eight to such a low light on 17, it's amazing. A double bogey there, and Els finished the day with a 69. Thomas LeVay only qualified for Royal Troon by winning the Scottish Open the previous weekend. The Frenchman carried his good form into the opening round, threatening the hole at the par 3 fifth. Kenny Perry made an even more impressive start on the very first hole. Oh! Two under for the hole and the round, the American would finish the first day with a 69. <laughs> Ahead at the 18th, Paul Casey was completing one of the rounds of the day. The Englishman says he used to try too hard at big tournaments, but after finishing tied for six at the Masters, believes he has learned how to relax in the majors. A five under par round of 66 would leave Casey in a share of the lead at the end of the first day. He was joined at the top of the leaderboard by Thomas LeVay, who lost out to Ernie Els in a playoff for the title at Muirfield two years ago. As the joint leaders were both finishing their rounds, Tiger Woods was making an ominously impressive start, with three birdies on the front nine.
With his position as world number one under threat from Ernie Els, Tiger was determined to put in a good performance and silence the growing debate about the state of his game. But inaccuracy off the tee had been a weakness all season, and Woods finished the first day four shots off the lead at one under par. Tiger always attracts huge galleries, but there was no question about the crowd favourite at Royal Troon. Colin Montgomery learnt his golf on these links, and after a difficult year for him personally, Troon's favourite son was given a warm welcome home. It was just what the Scot needed as he continued his quest for a first major title. I'm a member here and obviously, you know, played here from a very young age, so the support I have here is, is much more than it would be normally. I'm enjoying the whole experience, to be honest, of, uh, of playing here in an Open Championship. This Open couldn't have come at, the, at a better time for me or a better place. Another Scot, Stuart Wilson, began even more impressively. The amateur champion was three under par for the opening round and setting a stiff target for Nick Flanagan if he wanted to be leading amateur. The Australian missed a good chance to finish the first round on level par, but a 72 was still a promising start to his Open Championship career. His senior playing partner, Nick Price, was certainly impressed. His short game today was phenomenal. Um, he, he, he hit the ball pretty good, but he was just maybe a little bit out of sync, maybe a little nervous playing in his open, the open for the first time. Um, but what a beautiful short game. And, you know, I always look at a person when they're starting out, you can always learn to hit the ball pretty well, but if you haven't got a good short game, it's hard to learn. I think he's going to go places. For a little guy, he cer certainly hits the ball a long way too. At the end of day one, Price and Flanagan were back in the pack around par, chasing an international group at the top of the leaderboard. Aided by a rare albatross on the par five fourth hole, England's Gary Evans was among the surprise early leaders. After a glorious first day of weather and golf, conditions were forecast to remain good on Friday. Fans flocked to Troon to watch the world's finest golfers in unusually fine Scottish sunshine. During the Open, Troon's population of just 15,000 can increase by more than three times. It's a logistical challenge carefully coordinated by the Strathclyde Police Force. In terms of policing, we have 200 police officers each day dedicated exclusively to the, the Open Golf Championship. We're dealing with somewhere in the order of uh, up to 9,000 cars a, a day are, are coming along. Add on to that maybe 100 or so buses, and the buses are bringing perhaps 50 or 60 day people at a time. And we have about 8,000 people a day arriving by train. So by the time you take the, the paying public, the non-paying public, and the, the backroom staff, if I can call them that, we're dealing with somewhere between 50 and 60,000 people a day who are arriving here at Royal Troon. Perhaps the best way for those visitors to arrive at Troon is by train. Passengers get a sneak preview of the action on the 11th hole, the railway. The 11th was the toughest hole all week, with a stroke average well above par. South Africa's Retief Goosen was one player to tame it, though, as he looked to build on top 10 finishes at the previous two Open Championships. It was a day of consolidation for Michael Campbell, who needed a birdie on 13 to take him back to four under for the championship. Meanwhile, world number 55, Todd Hamilton, was moving up the leaderboard. The American only qualified for the PGA Tour at the eighth attempt this season, but had already won the Honda Classic back in March. He finished the day level with Campbell on four under par. <laughs> the 
Vijay Singh was continuing his steady start to the championship. The Fijian joined the group of players on four under, chasing an unexpected early leader. American Skip Kendall was setting the pace on day two. Yet to win on the PGA Tour, the 39-year-old played some spectacular golf in a 66, the joint best round of the day. Without a top 10 finish in his previous 11 appearances at the Open, Phil Mickelson's game is not supposed to be suited to Lynx golf. But the 34-year-old had already proved those who doubted his temperament wrong at Augusta National, and his round of 66 brought him right into contention. Joint overnight leader Thomas LeVay had a steady day, picking up another shot to move to six under par for the championship. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the postage stamp, 44-year-old Englishman Barry Lane confirmed his surprise place on the leaderboard with a superb tee shot. Less surprising was the emergence of Ernie Els as a threat. The South African recorded his fifth successive round of 69 at Royal Troon to join the group of quality players on four under. The biggest galleries on course were always around Colin Montgomery. The fans expected something from Monty despite his disappointing record in the Open Championship, where he'd never finished higher than eighth. A second successive 69 on his boyhood course left the Scot well placed, three strokes behind Kendall in the group at four under par. As the second day drew to a close, the champion the last time Troon hosted the Open safely qualified for the weekend. Justin Leonard finished on level par, three strokes inside the cut. But other former champions were not going to be around at the weekend. Ben Curtis completed a disappointing championship, becoming the first defending champion to miss the cut since 1999 winner Paul Laurie in 2000. Among the other former champions heading home early were Greg Norman, Nick Faldo, John Daly, Tom Lehman and Tom Weisskopf. Nick Flanagan's first Open was also coming to an end, but it was an honourable exit with Stuart Wilson the only amateur to make the cut. Flanagan missed out by three strokes. Played pretty well for most of the tournament and had two and three bad holes, which has cost me again. Um, a little bit disappointed, but um, I mean, I'm starting, starting a new, new step next week, so hopefully I can get out there and, and play better as a pro. At the end of another fine day, Skip Kendall had a surprise halfway lead but the likes of Vijay Singh and Ernie Els were lurking just behind him. There were just 23 players under par after two rounds. Even in such good conditions, Royal Troon was proving to be a tough test. For two days, Troon had been a calm and sunny home for the Open. But come Saturday, conditions were forecast to change. Some lively Scottish weather was threatening to blow the contenders off course. A traditional Lynx course, many of the holes at Royal Troon are right by the sea. The setting is certainly picturesque, but Troon's proximity to the Irish Sea makes it particularly susceptible to changeable weather. No one knows local weather conditions better than the RNLI Troon Lifeboat Station volunteers. Hello. 
there is a saying here, if you can't see Aaron, the Isle of Aaron from Troon, you know it's raining. If you can see Aaron, you know it's going to rain. In July, when the weather's hot like this, what can happen is as the land cools down quicker than the sea temperature, the wind can actually come round within 180 degrees uh, and become offshore. So any golfers playing the course, they're may going to have two hours of winds coming from the west and all of a sudden it's going to go swing around totally the other way and come from the east. And true to form, the calm weather ended on day three. The poor conditions hit the leaders hardest as they began their rounds. Thomas LeVay, an overnight leader, Skip Kendall, caught the brunt of the bad weather on the first hole. The wind and rain seemed to particularly affect Kendall. He carded a bogey there and would struggle all day, dropping three more shots. Conditions had been kinder as the rest of the field began their rounds. Saturday at a major is all about getting in position to challenge on Sunday afternoon, and there was an array of talent making a move at Royal Troon. Without a major since the 2002 US Open, Tiger Woods was looking menacing. A round of 68 moved Tiger to four under for the championship and right back in contention. Also making a move was Retief Goosen. The South African was one of just a handful of players to master conditions at the US Open the previous month and seemed equally unfazed by the mixed weather at Troon on Saturday. A 68 from Goosen took him to six under par for the championship in prime position for a Sunday title charge. But what the fans really wanted was to see Colin Montgomery storming up the leaderboard. It was a seesaw round for the Scot. He provided some great entertainment. But despite near miraculous recovery work from the sand on 14, he fell off the pace. A one over par round of 72 left Monty needing some final day heroics if he was going to challenge for the Claret Jug and give the fans at Troon the winner they wanted most. <laughs> Barry Lane hadn't won a tournament for a decade until claiming the British Masters in May. The English veteran stayed in contention for a shock victory here until three drop shots on the last two holes knocked him back to five under par. After playing through the worst of the weather, Thomas LeVay put together another steady round to stay six under for the championship. I played very, very good the front nine. The back nine wasn't, didn't go my way, but you know I got unlucky on one or two shots today and unlucky on two, so it's pretty happy about it. I'm only two behind and it's, uh, it's just perfect for tomorrow. Also two strokes off the lead by the end of play was Phil Mickelson. The Masters champion followed his 66 the previous day with a 68 to go six under par for the tournament. Mickelson was helped out by a big break on the 15th hole when his drive was heading way out of bounds. No. Oh, no. When I saw it up in the air, I thought for sure it was out. I mean, it was just turning with the wind. There was no nothing to stop it other than a gentleman's leg. Every now and then you, you need something like that to give you a little kickstart or, or to get keep you up in there. And, and uh, that certainly kept my round going and it was a, a very lucky break. A lucky break indeed and one that saw him stay right in contention. At the top of the leaderboard after a day that saw so many big names coming to prominence was a less familiar face, Todd Hamilton. 
The American didn't seem to be feeling any pressure as he put together the best round of the day, a 67, to take the clubhouse lead at eight under par. Hamilton had to play all over the world to earn a living from golf before finally qualifying for the PGA Tour this season. But he was a proven winner, with victories throughout Asia and 11 titles to his name in Japan alone. While he clearly knew how to win regular tournaments, the question being asked was whether he could hold on in a major, with so many big names chasing him down. I actually don't know what to feel. I, I've played so bad for so long. Uh, it's very strange to be sitting in here commenting on my golf. Usually uh, when I'm commenting on it, it's to my, to my wife or uh, my kids, you know, and it's usually in an angry tone. I'm very pleased, especially with the way the last two days have gone. The American's playing partner on day three was Ernie Els. He was equally impressive, carding a third successive round in the 60s to move one stroke behind Hamilton going into the final day. The two players would be paired together again for the final round. Els was looking forward to a tight contest. Well, I think you'd, you'd like to be leading. Um, but I'm right there, you know, at the moment I'm only one shot behind. Um, you know, and to be honest with you, I, a lead right now doesn't mean much, and especially if it's a one shot lead. Els seemed to be closing in on his second open and fourth major. Regarded by many as the best golfer in the world currently, the South African was in perfect position to provide conclusive proof that he really was the champion golfer of the year. Did you shake his hand? He's always wanted to shake your hand. Okay. Okay. Good luck, Ali. But it wasn't just Els threatening Hamilton. The third round leaderboard was looking decidedly impressive. And with the best round in the tournament so far of 66, the winner was likely to come from one of these eight players. <laughs> Expectation in Troon ahead of the final round was high. The Open was building up towards a classic finish, with the world's best golfers chasing Todd Hamilton. Surely the American couldn't hold off the likes of Ernie Els on the final day. Being part of the final group in the Open Championship is a unique experience. Els knew what to expect, Hamilton did not. As they prepared to tee off, they would hear the cheers for their challengers already out on course, and sense the growing tension all around the links. For anyone with them, there would be memories to cherish. Oh, it's fantastic. All the way around, I'm nervous, but especially when you get to the 18th. I mean, um, not the yesterday and things, when there's, everyone's sat in the, um, in the grandstand and everyone claps and you're walking down, it feels like part of it's for me. I know it's not, but it still feels a bit like that. For the final pair's scoreboard carrier, Paul Barker, there were already memories of an Ernie Owls victory in the Open. He carried the South African score in the final round two years ago. The first time I did it was back at Muirfield on the Sunday. Got drawn with the last group, which was with Ernie Ayers, obviously. And um, sat by the 18th when he won. And he came over the end and gave me a ball, which was quite nice. But Ricky, his caddy, um, went and spoke to him yesterday when we came off the course. And reminds him that I'd done it at Muirfield. He actually remembered me because I spoke to him a bit at the end. And um, he said to me, he said, oh, you're my lucky charm. So uh, I hope we'll be lucky from again today. While Barker waited by the first tee, the handful of players yet to start their final rounds and still in with a chance of winning the title made final preparations on the range, watched by large galleries. Large galleries, that is, for all but one of them. Because with just a handful of fans watching him at the far end of the practice ground, it was hard to believe that Todd Hamilton was leading the Open all on his own. 
But the American seemed oblivious to the lack of attention on him as he went through his bag of clubs, including the recovery wood he had also been using around the greens with great success. I'm just going to use the same, same game plan I had the first three days, avoid the bunkers. Uh, try to, when I miss shots, miss them in the correct spots around the greens, and hopefully my putter and my uh, chipper will behave rather nicely today. As Hamilton headed out to play his second successive round with Els, he did not seem to be feeling the nerves expected of him. I feel pretty good. Uh, I've played a lot of golf tournaments, uh, 30, 38 years old, so I haven't been in a position in the tournament like this, but I've I've played a lot of golf tournaments around the world. I'm just going to try to make this seem like one of those other golf tournaments. Hamilton followed Ernie's opening driver with an iron. His game plan was simple, keep the ball in play. But while there might be no fireworks expected from the American, those chasing him knew they had to make their own luck and make a move. And as the last pair began their final rounds at Royal Troon, ahead of them on the course, there was an extraordinary sequence of play. Former Masters champion Mike Weir was first on the move, going five under at the fifth. Tiger found the same bunker just as accommodating as he closed in on the lead. On the fourth, Thomas LeVay went eight under, and the final pair must have started to wonder what was going on ahead of them. Then Phil Mickelson followed LeVay's example at the same hole. The final round was shaping up to be a classic. By the time Scott Verplank holed out on the sink, the unexpected had become almost routine in 25 minutes of unbelievable golf. With Hamilton dropping a shot at the second, he was now surrounded by major winners. Things were hotting up for him and the championship. As for Els, a wild drive on the third looked like it was going to cost him. until it was stopped by the TV compound fencing. The South African would get a free drop from there, and he made the most of the break, conjuring up a birdie opportunity with his approach and the chance to go eight under. It looked like his lucky charm might be working for him. On the fourth, Hamilton brought his recovery club, a hybrid driving iron and wood, into use. The American's handiness with the club around the greens demonstrated his experience and his understanding of Lynx golf, regardless of his lack of experience contending in majors. Back to eight under, and it was becoming clear that he would not be gifting the title to anyone. Ahead, Colin Montgomery needed to start holding some chances if he was going to delight the galleries with a late charge. But it was looking more and more like another miss in a major for Monty when he began to shed strokes around the turn. Meanwhile, Hamilton was maintaining his solid start. Another birdie at the par three fifth, and he went nine under and back in the lead on his own. Up at the seventh, Mickelson could join him. Americans were on top again at Troon and looking to win the Open Championship here for the sixth successive time. Other challengers were running out of holes to make their move but there was still plenty of golf to be played. On to the eighth, and after finding the sand at the postage stamp, Els needed all his powers of recovery to stay with the leaders. But the South African then made a mess of 10 with a double bogey. If Hamilton dropped a shot on the same hole, Phil Mickelson would be in the lead on his own.
Hamilton was back at eight under, a shot behind his fellow American. After the early rush of birdies, other challenges were fading. On the 12th, Tiger was struggling to find any consistency and the green. A second successive bogey and another major was slipping away. Impressive work from the sand by Retief Goosen couldn't stop the US Open champion dropping out of contention as well. A 73 saw him finish on four under par. As for Thomas LeVay, he was holding on but not getting any closer to the lead. With the back nine proving as tough to score on as ever, it seemed to be turning into a three-horse race. The Frenchman was doing his best, but all eyes were turning to Mickelson, Hamilton and else. But the day's sequence of remarkable shots wasn't quite over yet. On the 18th, there was an early indication of the drama to come from Davis Love III. <laughs> After the American finish with a 67 on five under par for the championship, Lee Westwood matched what was the best round of the day to move six under par overall. The Englishman had come from nowhere to take the clubhouse lead, but he knew it wasn't going to be good enough to take the title. Nevertheless, Westwood was just happy to be back performing in a major. Back on 11, it looked like Els was going to drop another shot after finding a gorse bush from the tee. From the bush, sitting in the bush. In the middle of the bush. <laughs> But he would hack the suspended ball out, put his third on the green, and hole out for a remarkable par on the most difficult hole on the course. That kept Els at seven under, but Hamilton could go one better with a birdie opportunity on the same hole and the chance to draw level with Mickelson again on nine under par. With the final pair both parring the 12th and Mickelson dropping a shot on 13, there was no sign yet of a decisive move by one of the three leaders. But their closest challenger still on the course, Thomas LeVay, was not looking like forcing his way back into contention. The par 5 16th was the last good chance for anyone to pick up a shot. Birdie for Mickelson and he was right back in it and back as joint leader on nine under. <laughs> Hamilton relied on an impressive short game all week. He had missed 20 greens in the first three rounds but only carded five bogeys. On the short 14th, that sure touch gave him the lead on his own at 10 under par. Ahead, Mickelson was under pressure to save par on the 17th, but his short game is as good as anyone's, and he duly stayed at nine under. Time was running out for anyone to catch Hamilton. A birdie on 16 would move him to 11 under. Two clear of Mickelson and three ahead of Els. Nervous, there was no sign of it from the 38-year-old. Els knew he had to hold his own birdie opportunity on the same hole, miss, and there was virtually no chance of catching his playing partner. It was 
building into one of the great finishes to an Open Championship. Ahead on the final green, Mickelson had a tricky little putt to finish on nine under and stay in the hunt for his second major of the year. The Masters champion had set the target for the final pair. Nine under par was now the clubhouse lead. As Mickelson finished, Ells faced a crucial tee shot on the 17th. 222 yards to the pin, two shots behind Hamilton. He had to give himself a birdie chance. With Hamilton down in par, Ells could move within a stroke of the lead. A second successive birdie, and the gap was now just one shot. It was an incredible display from Els, right at the death of the Open Championship. And so to the 18th tee. Els had one shot to make up to force a playoff, two to win outright. After the South African fired his tee shot up the middle of the fairway, Hamilton showed the first sign of nerves. His tee shot was splayed into the rough. From there, the 38-year-old would only be able to hack out across the fairway. The door was ajar and Els barged it wide open, giving himself a wonderful chance of stealing the title from Hamilton. For everyone, from Els and Hamilton to Paul Barker, this was turning into an unforgettable open. After chopping out across the fairway, Hamilton was allowed to drop away from fencing in front of the grandstand and left with a tricky chip for his third shot. Two putts from there and he would finish his round with a bogey. And so Els was faced with a 10-foot chance to claim his second Open Championship. After the putts he'd made on 16 and 17, it looked a sure thing. It wasn't to be. After 72 holes, the pair had finished tied on 10 under par. For the second time in three years, Els was in a playoff for the title. Hamilton's achievement just staying in contention was clear from the decidedly impressive leaderboard. Six of the world's top ten finished in the top ten at Royal Troon. It was undoubtedly a course which brought the very best to the fore. The playoff began on holes one and two before returning to the clubhouse via 17 and 18. If the pair were still level after the four holes, they would replay 18 until a winner was decided. Oh. Els spurned the best chance to move ahead on the first extra hole, as both players parred the opening two holes of the playoff. Then it was back to the tricky par 3 17th, with Hamilton first to tee off. His years of struggling to make the big time were over, whatever happened here. But second place didn't seem to be an option. <laughs> Els had to wait for a plane taking off from nearby Prestwick Airport to pass before playing his tee shot. The tension seemed to be getting to the Big Easy.
Making par would be tough from there, and Hamilton looked to be back in charge. The American safely two-putted for his par. After chipping into the heart of the green, Els was left with a crucial putt to save his own. Past seven in the evening, and it was time to go back to the 18th with Hamilton one shot up again. And again it was Els who put himself in pole position after his drive split the fairway. Lying just short of the green in two, Hamilton called for a final time on his hybrid club, which had only been in his bag for a few months in place of his three-wood. It hadn't let him down around the greens all week. Hamilton had laid down the gauntlet. He was looking certain of his par, and Els knew he had to hold his own birdie putt to keep the playoff alive. It was almost exactly the same putt as he'd had an hour previously. Then, Els was putting to win the Open. Now, he was putting just to keep his hopes alive. For the third time in a decade, it seemed that Els was going to finish as runner-up in the Open. No consolation for him that this was already certain to be remembered as one of the most exciting final days in Open Championship history. <laughs> Hamilton was left with a straightforward little two-footer for the title. Straightforward, that is, when it's not for the Open Championship. I'm glad it wasn't uh, double the length. I just got up there, told myself, you've made dozens of these, hundreds, thousands of these over your career, whether it be practice or in tournaments, uh, straight back, straight through. Hamilton had seen off the world's best golfers and claimed his sport's greatest prize. I'm usually kind of a nervous guy, especially if I haven't been playing very well, which I hadn't coming to this tournament. Uh, but sometimes I get out there uh, and it almost seems fun. And I think today seemed like it was fun to me. I had my chances. You know, i got to give a lot of credit to Todd. I knew uh, what, a, what a good player he was and that he wasn't really going to back off. He stuck to his guns. I think he had his game plan and he stuck with it and, and it worked out this time for him. The winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer of the year is Todd Hamilton. What's the secret to winning? Uh, I think just believe in yourself. I knew I was a decent golfer. Uh, I knew I tried hard. Sometimes I think what kept me back, I felt uh, 
like tournaments like this, if I happen to get into, I didn't really feel uh, that I belonged. Uh, so maybe all that can change now. Thank you.